Luke 19, just one verse of scripture. We'll read more from this passage. Luke 19, very simply, verse 41. Speaking of Jesus, it says, As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. When Jesus approached the city and saw Jerusalem, he, the God-man, wept over that city. By the help of the Lord, I want to preach this is home. This is home. You may be seated. There are only two places recorded in the Bible where Jesus is said to have wept. The first is found in the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. Two words, Jesus wept. This is after Jesus was shown the tomb of Lazarus, and his reaction was to weep. Now, ultimately, we do not know what moved his tears. We can use context clues. We can speculate anywhere from weeping over unbelief of Lazarus' friends and family, perhaps even the consequences of sin, that he saw the reality of sickness and death due to the fall. Someone else could simply say his emotions. He's a man. And the Bible speaks of his love and closeness to his friend Lazarus. Or maybe it was a combination of some or all of these reasons. But what we do know is the Bible says that Jesus wept when he saw the tomb of Lazarus. The only other place that is found that Jesus wept is in the passage we just read. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, He wept over it. Jesus is lamenting the impending fate of the holy city, Jerusalem. Jerusalem that's known through Scripture as the city of our God. Zion, the city of the great king, all found in Psalm 48. Jerusalem that is known and defined as the city of peace, Shalom. Yet Jerusalem forfeited the peace that was rightfully hers. For if you read in this passage, Luke 19, the next verse, Jesus continues to his city as he weeps and says, If you had known, even you especially in this day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. What's he talking about? Jesus then prophesies in the next two verses that Jerusalem is going to endure a bitter siege and a decimation by what we know now as Titus' army. And he says in verse 43, he knows this, days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close in on you on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave one stone upon another. Why? Because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus is weeping. He is the Messiah. He was the one that was bringing them peace, but they did not recognize it. He said, you didn't know the way of peace. Jesus, God in flesh, the Prince of Peace was with them, but it was hidden from their eyes. They did not know the time of their visitation. God's personal visit 
that was with them right then. And he wept over that city. And I want to pause enough to apply that we don't want to miss our time of visitation as a church and as individuals. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the role God is asking us to play in his eternal purpose. What is he speaking to us to fulfill in this space between two eternities. Unlike Jerusalem, I want to be aware of God's visitation in 2022. As a church called Abundant Life and as believers as we serve Jesus, prayer and fasting is a good start in hearing what God has to say. That's why we're going to seek Him this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. That's why we're going to gather up in prayer this Tuesday night is because somehow we can't afford to miss our role and purpose in what God wants us to do in eternity. Jerusalem, I'm weeping because you've missed the God-man. I am the Messiah that was to bring peace. And let me tell you, Jesus' compassionate expression over the city of Jerusalem is found elsewhere in Scripture. If you go a few verses to the left, Luke chapter 13, you can see in verse 34, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. He says, the one who kills the prophets and the, and the stones, who, those who are sent to her. He's saying how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. Can you feel the nurturing, protective parent? The tones of that as Jesus is passionately, he's, he's, he's seeking the peace and the welfare of a city whose name probably meant the very foundation of peace according to Hebrews 17. But now, while he is there, God-man, he's lamenting this horrific catastrophic fate that's awaiting his beloved city behind which lay a long shameful history of them rejecting the prophets and slaying God's messenger. Yes, Jesus wept over the fate of a city called Jerusalem. And let me tell you something right now. If you hate a city, I just want you to know that Jesus is weeping over what you hate. While people want to avoid cities, Jesus went into the cities. And you may ask the question, what did he do when he went into the cities? I'll direct your attention to Matthew 9 and answer that question. Matthew chapter 9 verse 35 says, Jesus went about all the cities and the villages and he was teaching in the synagogue and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among them. Jesus went into the city teaching, preaching, and healing. I'd say that is a job description of the church of the living God. I'd say that's your mandate as an individual believer. Do you think that Jesus only saved you just to save you? He loved you and I enough to do that. But he also put in us a mandate of teaching and preaching and healing. Amen. Why weep over a city? Why go into a city, a village, or any other place that may be disgusting and repulsive to others? Well, those questions are answered with a question. What did Jesus find in those cities? you got to keep on reading in verse 36 of Matthew 9. The Bible says when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. I don't find animosity here. I don't find contempt here. I don't find they get what they deserve. I say that Jesus, when he saw what was in the city, he said to the disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you to the conclusion of what Jesus was saying in these verses is love the land and love the people. Love the land and love the people. 
Ah, I can't love people without loving the land they're in. And I can't say I love the land without loving the people that are in there. I'm telling you, we've got to get to the point where we accept the fact like Jesus did that he's called us. This is home. And this thought has burned in my spirit long before this day, long before November when I was going to cast vision, long before that. And I must say that I have found even some places that has helped me voice what I was feeling. Uh, Brother David McGovern and uh, uh, another one that I've forgotten about. Forgive me, Lord, and forgive whoever it is. All right. But we got to stop speaking negatively about cities and their people. I'm trying to help you because you may be doing it unintentionally. That's why we learn from the Word of God. Oh, I'm not talking about the denial of reality. There, there, there's a lot of challenges and upside-down situations in our world, right? There's a lot of things that are messed up. But here's my point. Instead of complaining and condemning, why don't we pray for our city? And why don't we pray against the principalities of darkness? And why don't we bind the works of the flesh? I'll see you Tuesday if you're going to help me with that. I say, God, give us a contrite spirit about our city, about our nation, and about its people. We live in a culture that's accusatory and biting and negative attitudes. And instead of you saying, yeah, I know what political camp you're talking about, I'm talking about all political camps. It's biting. It's negative. That does nothing to change the situation except personally venting. But prayer changes things. I said prayer changes things. Maybe it'll help you. For close to two years, we have been preaching, teaching, and talking about taking new territory. And that message has not been ended. In reality, it's still just getting started. But I want to help you to fully comprehend what I'm trying to convey here today. That today's vision and, 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 and in the months to come and buying into this as a congregation, there's another layer to taking new territory. It's what I may call territorial bonding. I'm going to take this territory holding my nose. I'm going to take this new territory because that's what somebody kicked me in the seat of the pants to do. What would happen if we started loving the land and loving the people? I'm not talking about turf protection. I'm talking about embracing and loving the territory that God has given us. I'm talking about this is home. Hello, quit looking around your shoulder or behind you and understand that you are home. You're home in this geographical area. You're home in this church. God has called you. Quit looking elsewhere and say, this is home. And let's start bonding with this place. Let's start bonding with our role and our responsibility that God has set for us. Because when we do, God is going to work through those that love the land and love his people. Now, I'm going to help you be specific. Num number one, I've referenced it, is the physical land, the physical location and geography. The specific city. Jesus was specific. He wept over Jerusalem. It was a real estate that he was doing. We talked about taking new territory, that it literally means real estate. We need to bond with where God has placed us. Certain neighborhood. Certain region. A certain county, the place you live, specific city, physically. You know, they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. When I start bonding with where God has called me, what tourists may say is trashy. I say, yeah, I guess we could clean up, but it's, it's beautiful because this is my place. 
But it's not just a physical land. I've alluded to it, but I'm being clear. Number two, it's a sphere, an area, a role in a certain ministry. In short, we are speaking of bonding. That means an attachment to. It means an affection to the place and the role God has given us. Maybe this will help you. We've said it before, and I agree with it. It's important to put a face on things, isn't it? When you put a face on something, it gives, it gives a clarity and focus to a passion and a burden. Amen? I can say love your city, but if, if I say uh, uh, Northeast Maryland, Sister Shalon, that puts a face a little bit better on it. And then if I name your neighbor next door, that puts even a better face on it. So I love putting faces on things because it goes from generic to specific. It goes from principle to person. And let me tell you, throughout history, I'll just leave it here, anytime a society dehumanizes people, it leads to terrible things. All that stuff you're speaking disparagingly about, a group or ethnicity or whatever it is, put faces on that and look at me and say that. But in addition to putting a face on things, I'm here to preach, we need to put a place on things. I'm talking about that not just reaching the world, we're talking about reaching Baltimore and its metropolitan area. This is home. The Maryland, D.C. district that God has given us. He has given us two wonderful metropolitan areas in Baltimore and D.C. And it is our joy to minister. It is our responsibility. It is our territory. And it could mean a neighborhood. It could mean a subdivision. It could mean an apartment complex. It could mean a workplace. But the more we narrow the faces and the places, the sharper our focus becomes when you start driving home to your neighborhood I want you to get a new attitude and say this is my turf <laughs> not territorialism but ownership and love and say I live here and you say this is home because you walk through the door I say it's home because you started into the subdivision because it was a part of a city this is home Hallelujah. That's what God's calling us to. is something that we understand as a face and a place. Is this starting to make sense? You know, we say this is home. I'll put these on so I can find out if it is making sense. Oh, take them off. Just kidding. There's a difference, isn't it true, between the connotation of a house and a home? I said connotation. I didn't say denotation. Those of you that are getting on Google search and comparing that. But, you know, when we talk about that, you know, I think sometimes we reference a house. It's a building for human habitation. It's a house. But a home, it's different, isn't it? It's a place where someone lives permanently. But they're especially a member of the family. It's a household. That's why we say it's starting to feel like home. Have you ever moved into a place and you were in the house, but you said it started to feel like home after a while because of your environment? Uh, we sold our house in July, and we're living in an apartment about five minutes from this church. There's another house being built in Falston. As much as the house we just sold that was our home for 17 years, but even so, the smaller apartment, when we're doing, everyone shift to the left, to the right, in the kitchen, when we're all in there. With all of that, it's still home. It's a place of refuge. Because there's an adage that says it this way. Home is where the heart is. And that's the nutshell and the vision of this message. That home is is where the heart is. It's got to go beyond a Sunday morning message. Because hear me, if you get your heart in the place you are, then the faces of the place become home to you. Love the land and love the people. I'm going to say it again. 
Because words mean something. Well, I didn't really mean that, but I'm telling you, words are powerful. They inform your attitude. They inform your spirit. And so if you speak with disdain about the people you live with, work with, minister with, I just want to remind you, Jesus is weeping over them. We're thinking about that, aren't we? They drive me nuts. Jesus is weeping. I'll give you a scripture principle for what I just said. Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is home. Making a commitment to the land, the mission, the people. I have a question for you. Do you really think, do you really think that you are in Baltimore, Maryland because of just a chance? That God had nothing to do with it. Whether you're living here from birth, whether you transferred here, whether you're a guest and you're here for whatever reason, are you really believing that God has nothing to do with where you are and why you're here? I pose it as rhetorical because I don't believe that you subscribe to such a thing that God had nothing to do with it. So if that is true, then your city is where you live, work, and play. It's where God has you right now. This is where I'm supposed to be. And the Great Commission starts with where you are at. Go ye into all the world. And we just go into a days. I'm not in Tuesday prayer meeting because I'm trying to find the world that I'm supposed to reach. And let me tell you something, embracing this as home, are you listening, will affect your sense of belonging and usefulness. Some of you feel misplaced because the core issue is you've never settled this as home. Apply that however you want to. Geographically, roles, whatever it is. And this was the other one that I listened to this message. It's coming up right now. A quote by T.F. Tenney. There are those who are just passing through looking for a better opportunity. They never succeed where they are. You can apply that to whatever place and level you're in. If you are always looking for a better opportunity, then you will never succeed where you are. I mentioned this in our organic introduction of This is Home and the Jones testimony. God worked all that out. In essence, they were saying this is home. But I mentioned that. Have you ever tried to go anywhere looking over your shoulder? I mean, if I'm going to make direct, quick, intentional steps, I'm looking forward. And what I'm trying to tell you is that, that if you don't have, and, and I'm challenging you, I know that, but I'm getting ready to get into the, some helps. <clears throat> if you don't have a passion and a burden for the place you are, Listen to me, pray until you get one. I'm going to break that down. Number two, intentionally invest in the faces and the places. Has nothing to do with feeling. Act as if until the passion comes and it becomes home. Let me illustrate it. I said pray until you get one. Some of you are going to say, oh boy, is that all he's going to do for me? I'm going to be specific on how you can pray that will help you. And I've practiced this. I have um, given this as a help to others. And it actually was demonstrated in our prayer through Brother Anthony this morning. Specifically call out names of the place you need a burden and passion for. I'm telling you, I've seen it work. I remember we were in Pulaski Highway in a prayer room. Um... Uh, Wade Haskins had become our youth pastor. He hadn't been there very long. He's coming in from Georgia, from Texas. I mean, you know, let's get real. He's, he's trying to own this. You know, here's some young people. Okay, hi, young people. You're a house, but you're not a home to me. And he said, I want to connect to this. I said, you know what you need to do? I said, make a list of every young person and bring, when we come and pray together every week, start calling those names out in prayer and see if a heart And a connection doesn't happen. I'm telling you, it'll happen every time if you do it sincerely and consistently. 
So what I'm saying is, again, I'm not trying to be pie in the sky. Maybe you wish you had a better home. Maybe there's a lot of things you wish was. But let me tell you, what would happen if the places God has put you and the faces God has put in your life that you would specifically start calling out those names? And I'm talking about literally and audibly call out those names. The names of people that you live with and are near to. The names of people that you work with. The names of people that you serve in ministry in this church. I'm telling you, something will happen and you'll start saying, you know what? This is home. Are you listening or sleeping? I'll take one or two. No. Do on location praying. Why have we talked through the years about prayer walking? Because what you desire can become home if you do on location prayer. Right now I suggest prayer driving, not prayer walking. If you're going to prayer walk, you're going to walk fast. And it's going to be Jesus wept and I'm back in the car. But it doesn't change that I'm on location. Does this make sense? We can pray for Kingsville. But there's nothing like being in Kingsville and praying, this is my neighborhood. This is my home. This is where God has called me. I'm trying to help you. If you say, Pastor, I'm not where you say I should be when you're preaching. This is how you do it. Start praying. And the second one I mentioned was invest. Everybody say invest. It's an act of service. It's bearing somebody's burden. It's attending a funeral. It's a shared experience through group life. These are the things that I invest in people. And when I do, love and passion and home takes place. Hear me today. And he's not here because he's in Jamaica. And I didn't even know if I was going to say this. But Devon Bailey, who recently joined our church, I'm telling you, this is what I'm talking about. That uh, he's in Jamaica. There's a, in fact, we should pray. It was his Uncle, I believe, that passed away. But, uh, but I, I noted this to Devon. He hasn't been here very long. And you know what? When, he, when it was announced that, that Beverly had lost her husband, Beverly Williams, he doesn't know Beverly Williams, but he's over there praying for him. You know why? Because that's his sister in the Lord. He doesn't have to have a 20-year history. And I'll pray with you if you were at Dundalk with me. But I won't pray with you if I don't know you. No, no, no. This is my home. This is my people. This this is the body. This is what I'm a part. And if you'll start investing, passion will come. I said passion will come and this is your home. I thought this was going to be a two-part series. Instead, it would be a two-hour message. <laughs> You're hoping that chuckling is for real. <laughs> I think you know me. But I want to say a few more things. Because I want to help you. I am not saying this is home is instantaneous. Does that help some of you? Uh, as I already mentioned, when we move into a new house, a new place, we say, does it feel like home yet? Your family is there, but you're adjusting to the brick and mortar. You're remembering which way to the bathroom at 3 in the morning. <laughs> if you don't think what I'm talking about, your day's coming. And it's what I call the lesson of the gap. So, for whatever reason, if you come as a new believer into this faith community, is RJ here? Is RJ here? Okay. He was recently baptized. He's supposed to come. When people come into our faith community, it's understandable. They don't have the comfort level as some of us that's been in the way or on the way. You decide where you are. And uh, there, there is a place here. And then, and then here's all these you know, 
everybody knowing everybody. And there's this, this, it's a gap, right? How many, how many either through a new believer or maybe coming from another church, you understand there's, there's a natural gap that takes place. All right? That makes sense. Okay, the first thing we do is identify this is normal. Have you ever been to a doctor or talked to somebody, and they may, not, they may not even be able to fix you, but if they just tell you it's normal, you feel better? Case in point, I just had surgery, and this is happening. It's hurting. And they say, this is normal. It'll get better. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. So what I'm saying, first of all, it's normal to have a gap, okay? But here's the thing we've got to keep in mind. There has to be, from both ends, pushing to close that gap. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, abundant life is not perfect. We try our best, but we're not perfect and don't always get it right. But I found out sometimes people that are not pushing from the other end, they want to blame the uh, uh, shortcomings of the organization. Ooh, I am in there deep now. I better roll up my pant leg. I've talked to people. I've never felt at home. And I've talked to people that were very honest and said, but i got to admit that I really haven't taken advantage of what they're doing. You've got to appreciate that honesty. You know, we're up here saying, praise the Lord, community groups, it's Thursday. Hello. We're doing this. We're pushing up. Hello, we got Bible studies. Hello, we got, we're pushing up. But then there's a key ingredient that you got to push down with participation. And in that process, I repeat that this is home is not instantaneous. But if we act as if, if we invest, if we pray until the burden comes, it will become home. We just can't give up. And we got to quit looking over our shoulders and say, this is it. Now i got to answer another question because you all are so smart, you're thinking ahead of me. It's not instantaneous, but isn't there people that are no longer here and this used to be home and now they're in another home? Right? Because I'm going to tell you, I'm not suggesting that everyone that physically stays in a city for life. Things change. We get that. But I'm going to tell you right now, Quit looking over your shoulders and looking for other opportunities when you know this is where I am right now. If I'm to be any other place, God will let me know when he needs to let me know that. And I'm not going to just sit here in just uh, la-la land waiting for something that may or may not ever happen. Well, I am preaching today. Here's, here's, here's the way I say it. And I've been through this. Love as if, because it may be. Illustration, blueprint for my personal ministry. Born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. Went to Mississippi. Spent nine years there, including college and working for the local church and youth ministry. Traveled for six years as an evangelist. Been a pastor for this fall, 25 years at a place called Abundant life. It's a great place. You ought to go there sometime. But if when I was in Jackson, Mississippi, I already knew when I got my license, they said, Where's your, wh what do you see your ministry doing? And I said, well, I'm going to youth, I'm in youth ministry right now. I feel like the Lord's going to lead me to travel, and then I'm going to assume a pastorate of a church, and probably when I get to that church, that'll be my lifelong mission. That just depressed some of you, but at 57, I'm not going anywhere. So I, I, the Lord gave me that blueprint. But you can interview anybody in Jackson, Mississippi for those nine years and ask if I was saying, well, whatever. I ain't going to be here always. Oh, no, no, no. Those were my people. I was home. I acted as, as if, and I'm telling you, it was Southern culture and all. 
I learned it. It was mine. I was home. Even though God gave me that other long blueprint, let me tell you, it wasn't even in my mind until God started tapping me on the shoulder of what I call the beginning of the end, which was about a year. Now that one gets challenging when he says, your time is up and you get a year. I've got, if you need help on that one, come see me. I, I can't preach everything today. But I know how to help people through the, through the, the beginning of the end. And I'm saying this right now. Please don't have a concrete mind. I'm not, my personal ministry is pastoral ministry, but you may be in a local ministry. You may be in something where you're starting to feel some changes and things like that, the beginning of the end. You dialogue about those things. You don't stay in your cocoon and then come out a year later, hey, team lead, I'm out of here. You talk about it. You get counsel. You bounce things off people. Donovan, Missouri was our home when we traveled for six years. I'm telling you, I went from southern culture to small town culture. And let me tell you, that was a culture shock also. Town of 1800, I guess, something like that. It was very convenient to try to do business. Get your license, just walk up. But when we went into the bank and... Uh, I, we opened a bank account. I said, I'm Dave. He said, oh, yeah, I heard you moved in. I said, you heard what? <laughs> I felt like all eyes were on me. He said, oh, yeah, we read it in the newspaper. What? <laughs> Grandma Moulter wrote an, account, uh, an article for the church every week. And admittedly, it was more like a family report. And she moved, her grandson and granddaughter moved into town. Said, okay. I got a speeding ticket. It was in the paper. We're talking about close and intimate. <laughs> Let's just put it this way. I love Baltimore. <laughs> but hear me. In that short time, that was my people. I wasn't even, I was just my home base. I traveled other places. But I was always saying, you know what, Lord? If you call me here, you know, I, I, I could get used to this because there's some advantages. Because you could probably be mayor of the town in three years. Some of the things, that the challenges we face in this city of saturation and exposure. Man, all that stuff is done for you. There's advantages wherever you go. Quit looking at the disadvantages and say, God has put me where I am. I'm going to embrace it and go with it and love it. And you know what I did? Trust me, I'm not great. These principles are great. But I found Kitty. Kenny that worked at the newspaper place. I said, quit publishing all that. No, I didn't say that. I talked to Kenny, and we met with for lunch. I helped try to disciple him and try to get him into the place he needed to be in God. In that short time, I, uh, I, I wrote a couple books. I did what I could. You know what I'm trying to tell you is nothing is a stepping stone. Nothing in your life is a stepping stone when you're living in the moment. You may look back and see how the past prepared you for your present, but living it in real time is exactly where God wants you to be. Roll up your sleeves and let's have revival. Roll up your sleeves and say, this is home. I'm going to do what I can. If you'll bloom where you're planted, your roots and the fruit of your ministry will grow. And you know what else it'll do? It'll transfer if God so designs another home. I didn't take time to get a picture of it. I have it. But my niece, Angela, they just sold their house. And uh, she had in the backyard what she called a heritage place. So cool. Her husband's grandmother, there was a relic from there. There was this deer that my dad loved that she would brought over, her grandfather. And then there was a road, rose bush from her great-grandmother that was in my grandmother's yard, transferred to my mother's yard, and she picked it up and she took it to her yard. Are you, are you seeing what I'm saying? Nobody transfers a rose bush that's dead. 
And so if you don't bloom where you're planted, why do you think God's going to call you to another place? I am preaching. It's amazing me. I'm preaching. I feel the Holy Ghost in, the, in spite of all this silliness that I'm doing. This is home. And of course I'm preaching to our church. But if you're a guest with us, either in person or online, I, I, I believe you can pull this principle that there's so much restlessness and, and there's so much negativity, etc. And I'm not saying this is, um, what are some of those fairy tales uh, that just, I see her, that she jumped out of a window and went to the fair. What's that? No, not that one. The one that was always positive about everything. Pollyanna, thank you. It's not a fairy tale. Yeah, well. A story! I don't care. I am not trying to preach this Pollyannaism that, you know what, you know, it just, you know, I mean, my, my roof is leaking and I'm so happy about it. But I do think there's times where we just need to understand we'll do what we can do, but at the end of the day, this is home. It's like that old rabbi that uh, a man came to him and said, um, there, there's, I've got a goat in my house and uh, it, it's, 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 uh, it, it's, it's terrible. It's inconvenience. It smells, etc. He said, what I want you to do is get out seven more goats and bring them. Why would I want seven more goats? But yes, sir. I'll take them in there. Take them right in there. Finally, he said, I'm good. One goat's not bad at all. Just understand that this is home, wherever you are. Let me do this. If you were born in the Baltimore area, metropolitan area, go many counties out, but you were born here. Would you mind standing, please? If you were born in and around this area. So you could say this is home because this is where you were born, and rightfully you should. But I want to ask you a question. Why are you still here? Is it to check a box? Is it just, no, I want you to know that it's a testimony that this remains home for you. And that God has placed you in this city. And after 25 years, there's things I know that I didn't know 25 years ago. But I would argue there's things that you all know that I'll never know intuitively, experientially, certainly geographically. God has placed you. And I'm just trying to expand our vision that, that why am I still here? It's because God has placed me here. And this is home. Again. God moves people. If I didn't believe that, you wouldn't have a pastor. I'd still be in St. Louis. But God does things in his own time and order. And what I'm telling you and what I've illustrated, wherever I've been, it's always been, this is home, and whatever the preacher or the pastor or the vision of the church is, it means me. I don't exempt myself from it. I am there. And it was placed in my roots when we had church Tuesday night, Thursday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday night. The Reaver family said, this is home, and Apostolic Pentecostal Church is my home, and we're going to be there in, in spite of some pick Tuesday or Thursday. That's not us. And we need to get a spirit in us that this is home. This is my church. I'm going to live for it. I'm going to love for it. I'm going to love the land. I'm going to love the people. I'm going to buy into what God has given me. Now, let me segue into my next point. Sean Taylor was raised in the city of Baltimore, but he hasn't always lived in Baltimore. But because of the matter of movement, and you need to think first Thursday to know what I'm talking about. Because of the matter of movement, God brought him and Lisa back to love the land and love the people. And it segues me into this next one. You may be seated.
There are people that moved into this city for no other reason but to specifically minister and reach the city. I get it. There's other God moves, whether it's a vocation, whether it's a circumstance, whether it's a calling or a transfer, I get all of that. But I want you to know that God uses those people and he uses other people to place within us the key ministries and the vital things that we must do to reach the people of this city. Anthony and Erica Hansen, I know that's been one of the more recent stories that we've heard, how that they recently moved two years ago, somewhere in there from Portland. A God thing. Never been to Baltimore. Never been to the Northeast. Never lived. I can have fun because when I text them about, hey, how was Christmas or whatever, I think it was Erica, maybe Anthony too. Been smart if he did too. Just kidding. But she said, glad to be in caps, home. They're not playing here. This is home. But you may not even know. I know Pat's here. Is Roger here? Okay, Pat, you got to stand. Are you aware that this lady and her husband, almost 40 years ago, 39 years ago, moved to this city from Louisiana? Not because they were preachers, but because God called them to help establish and plant this church that we are now in. And that's another example. Others already lived here. Let me say this. If you were a part of Dundalk United Pentecostal Church, the original name and plant, stand please. This is home. You're not going to tell me that these people haven't had to deal with disappointments and offenses. You're not going to tell me that these people haven't had to deal with people in life and goofy things like pastors and stuff like that. But you know what? There's something in their spirit that says, I don't have to be a pastor to be called to a city. This is my home. This is where I dwell. This is where I live. And this is not all of them, of course. There's others that are not here because they're online. I'm telling you, this is home. And somewhere, we've got to ignite back into us or for the first time into us a spirit that says, this is my home, whether I've been here two weeks, whether I've been here two years, or whether I've been here for 40 years as this, past, as this church is about to celebrate. Everybody has their story. But in 1997, when I visited Baltimore, and then Pastor Chris Tharp was showing me around, it was no surprise that God had put me another one of those transitions of the beginning of the end. I knew my evangelizing days were about over, didn't know when or how, but it was another one of those beginning to the end, those joyous times when you stay focused on what you're doing, but yet you know there's a change. I told you I could help you with it, but I can't resist this. Your passion then comes in investing in the transition. That's where you get your passion. So if you know God's moving you in a different ministry, I said a different ministry. I don't know anybody God's called to retire. He doesn't say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, until we get up there. Some of you say, well, the Lord told me just yesterday, well done, thou good and faithful servant, I'm done with ministry. <laughs> You're on a different frequency. I didn't hear that. But when you have to transition, you put your passion into the transition. So I knew there was a beginning to the end. But once again, it was a house, but it wasn't home. It was a city, but it wasn't mine. It was your workplace, but you see it differently. It's your neighborhood, your county, but you see it differently. And for me, 
And I, I like to, I know this Baltimore area is so much bigger than just the Inner Harbor, but you can't help but think about that when you think of our city. So we were down there at the Renaissance. It's still there, and they had some kind of breakfast buffet, and I looked out over the harbor. I go a lot of places, and I see beauty. I see callings. We were on vacation in Colorado, and I found this place, but Breckenridge, Colorado, and there's another city that starts with a D. Like three cities right together, like 10,000 people, beautiful area. And I'm saying, oh, my goodness, no church here. Brooke, oh, there goes Dad. So I went to the NAM meeting in August, and I saw the Colorado director and said, what's going on there? So I can, I can fall in love quick, okay? I can see beauty in things, but there's a difference then when I look at that harbor, and I didn't just see beauty. I heard a Macedonian call. It became home to me. And of course, it's grown just as recent as this past three or four days. We were in district board meetings, and we went down to eat in the Inner Harbor. And the Lord was calling me to Kilwins to get some peanut brittle. It's so good. I got one, and I went back to the car, and Christina said, you didn't get two? So I ran back. Got, that was permission. I got to get it done before the fast. Lay aside every weight and sin that doth so easily beset you. But even then, I didn't even mention it to Christina, but just walking around my Fells Point, it's my Fells Point. I mean, we take people down there, and I, it's just, it's those old bricks, cobbled streets, those, those are ours. I'm proud of them. And I know that's, you say, well, that's just a physical thing. It's right. It's just a physical thing. But I'm telling you, we have to love the land and then more importantly then the people that are in the land. And I'm not here to judge anyone. I think we're human. I think we all have good intentions. And I think sometimes we just stray from our focus. And that's why God calls me to get us back on focus and start seeing things differently than we have been seeing them. And stop all the confusion. And some of you are sincere. Like, well, I don't know. What, what, what should I be doing? But I'm telling you very clearly, you know what you need to do? This is home. What do you want me to do? What ministry do you want me in? What can I do for my neighborhood? Maybe I could have a party for my neighbors. We've had housewarming parties that we threw for ourselves when we moved into a house. We didn't want any gifts. Told them that, although they did bring me a bottle of wine. <laughs> no consumption. But I said, what, what can I do? I said, you know what? We just want to get to know you. From there, we found neighbors. We found friends. It's so, it's so easy to get in our little world. And surely in the day we're in now, and, and the things that we fight, all this meism and this culturalism, etc. I'm telling you, get rid of all that toxic stuff by just putting a smile on your face and saying, God's good. I love this land. I love this people. No, they're not perfect. Your natural family isn't perfect. I didn't insult you, did I? None of our families are perfect. And they get on your nerves. But don't let anybody else talk about your family. I mean, they can say the same thing you were saying, but uh -uh, you ain't going to say that. It's me that's saying that. And so I'm not trying to be so legalistic that you can say, you know what, we need to clean up the trash in this neighborhood or I don't like this. But you know what, it's coming from somebody that's invested, loves it, and it's coming from a different place than a tourism, just tourists coming in and just trying to criticize. Don't be criticized in our city. And then let's do something about it. All right, let's bow our heads and you start praying. You start praying where you need to pray. If you're listening to me right now, 
I'm your pastor and you're watching me online, start praying. Start praying all over this campus. If you're a guest with us, I know this could be an unusual message, but I'm here to tell you that God has placed you where you are right now, and the restlessness is causing problems. It's causing a lack of ownership. There's things that are becoming, and if somewhere I could just say, you know what, this is my home, but pastor, I don't know. Maybe I'm feeling the beginning of the end. Well, you know what? Go get counsel. Talk about that, but it doesn't change the fact that you are here. The most dangerous thing you can do is come to your own conclusions without getting help and counsel and advice, but right now, God is where I, he's got me. It's right here, and I'm thankful for it. I think the first thing we ought to do is start thanking the Lord for where he's placed us. Would you start now? It doesn't have to be loud, but it needs to be out loud. And start saying, thank you, Lord, and fill it out. Fill out, fill out the blanks there. Thank you, Lord, for fill out the, the, the church. Thank you, Lord, for placing me here. Start saying, thank you, Lord, for the city you live in, the neighborhood you live in. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you for those thieves that steal my Amazon every other day. Hallelujah. Come on, that's it. Somewhere in there. We're not excusing sin, but somehow Jesus was able to look beyond that. Don't you understand that he knew Jerusalem was going to be devastated? He knew that they missed their hour of visitation. He knew that they rejected the prophets, including the Messiah that was with them, but he still wept. He was still moved with compassion. He said, they're like sheep without a shepherd. He said, but I have a plan. I'm going to weep for you. I'm not going to condemn you because I know somewhere my mercy is going to reach you again. In the name of Jesus, are you you praying right now? Are you offering thanksgiving? Are you saying, Lord Jesus, I need you today. I'm available to you. I'm available to you. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. That's it. Pray all across this house right now. That's it. That's it. In the name of Jesus. That's it. That's it. Where are you right now? You can, you can pray where you are. You can lean forward. You can come forward to this altar. You can turn around in your chair. You can do whatever you want to do, but let's spend a little moment here. Let's spend a season here. I understand that, that, that I am setting the tone in the atmosphere, not just for this week of prayer and fasting, but in the days and weeks and months to come that God is saying, Lord, where are you? I'm weeping for the place you live. I'm weeping for the people that you live with. That's it right now. In the name of Jesus, respond however you need to. I'm just saying you can stand, you can sit, you can kneel, you can come to the front, you can walk the aisles, you can pray however you're praying in your house right now, in your home. But right now we need to say, Jesus, help me to internalize this. Show me, Lord God, what I haven't seen before. Help me, Lord Jesus, to understand that, that anything negative that I say in person or I say online that, that I want to be redemptive. Of course, we all have opinions and frustrations, but I want to be redemptive of the land I live in. I want to be redemptive of the people that I minister to. I want to pray for those. The Bible even says pray for those that, that despitefully use you. I want to pray for my government leaders. I want to pray for where God has placed me. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, is anybody available here today? Is anybody available? Is anybody available to make this home? If you're available, I want you to respond some way.